All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Ritartha. I'm a 2007 Notre Dame graduate who works with the Proud to BND team in Notre Dame's development office. I'd like to welcome all of you tuning in from around the world to our second Join the Fight webinar in partnership with the university's What Would You Fight For campaign. Today, we speak with Notre Dame Professor Krupali Krusha on her fight to preserve some of the world's most treasured landmarks. And now, I'll introduce our guests for the hour. Joining us from Rome, uh, Professor Krupali Krusha is the Academic Director of Rome in Notre Dame School of Architecture, where she teaches architectural design and historic preservation. Since 2007, she has founded and directs DARMA, the Digital Historic Architectural Research and Material Analysis Research Team, specializing in 3D documentation of World Heritage Sites. Since 2008, the team started its first major project by documenting four Renaissance Age major tomb monuments in India, one of them being the famed Taj Mahal. She is the co-author of Rediscovering the Secrets of the Hindu Temple and has degrees from Bombay University, Dessau, and the Technical University in Dresden, Germany. Welcome, Professor. Also, we have Kristen Gates joining us, a third year architecture student at Notre Dame from Pasadena, California. Her interests include architectural history and theory, design thought process, and traditional building methods, especially that of Eastern architecture. After graduation, she wants to pursue graduate work in historic preservation with the goal of researching and teaching preservation of Eastern architecture. Her other interests include sustainability, psychology, theology, and in regards to architecture, the traditional construction methods of arches and vaults. Welcome, Kristen. Hi, thank you. All right, so we're gonna uh, get started. We're gonna show the video once more in a minute, uh, and then Professor is gonna take us through a, a short presentation. Um, meanwhile, I know many of you are joining us from all around the world and from many different areas of academic interest. So if you have questions, uh, there's three ways that you can ask questions during the hour here. Um, we're accepting questions through the Hangout sidebar, the Q&A sidebar, if you're watching us in Google Hangouts. You can also send us an email, proud to be Notre Dame at gmail.com. That's all one word, proud to be Notre Dame at gmail.com. Or ask us questions on Twitter using the hashtag proud to be ND. And we'll announce that a couple other times uh, through the presentation as well. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We want to make this as interactive of a session uh, as possible. So without further ado, hopefully many of you saw it during Notre Dame's big uh, senior day win against Wake Forest on Saturday. But we're going to show the latest installment of the What Would You What Are You Fighting For series starring Professor Krusha. Stand by. Taj Mahal is a symbol of beauty, a window to the past, the pride of my country. And in an instant, it could completely disappear. It is hard to imagine, but last April, only 500 miles from here, the Gorkha earthquake devastated Nepal and completely destroyed some of the world's greatest architectural wonders. But what if those buildings could be restored? What if history could be brought back to life exactly as it was? In partnership with the lead archaeologist of the Taj Mahal, Notre Dame professor Krupali Kruse is providing unparalleled documentation of this World Heritage Site, identifying any signs of distress or decay. This collaboration with Professor Krusha began because she had the right mix of technology and expertise for the comprehensive digital mapping, which will be crucial for the future conservation and preservation of the Taj Mahal. Our 3D blueprints allow us to understand how ancient structures were built and the techniques used to construct them. So in the event of natural or man-made damage, they could be restored to their original state. In addition to the Taj Mahal, Professor Cruche and her students are also mapping the Roman Forum and other endangered cultural sites. As a native of India, it gives me great pride to know that my work at Notre Dame is ensuring that the wonder and beauty of the Taj Mahal will be here for generations to come. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting to preserve our heritage. We are the Fighting Irish. Okay. 
Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, again, if you guys have questions, feel free to both use the Q&A uh, module in your Google Hangouts uh, video screen if you're watching us on Google Hangouts. Or you can send us an email, proud to be Notre Dame at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag proud to be ND. Professor, we'll turn it over to you for today's presentation. Well, thank you, first of all, for the great introduction. Uh, I just wanted to introduce to you guys a bit about what we do at Dharma beyond the ad that you saw. Um, and so if you guys can see this presentation, uh, it's a short presentation describing the projects that we are doing and also some of the future work we plan to do. Um, so let me just start by giving you a quick understanding of the image of Notre Dame. Notre Dame in the last 10 years has uh, transformed quite a bit. Um, a lot has been done in regards to research at Notre Dame and to bring up the image of Notre Dame with, as a, a pioneer research university. And in regards to that, the School of Architecture and the Dharma team has also wor been working hand in hand with this vision of the university. The School of Architecture itself has a wonderful classical program where students learn how to design and work with classical buildings and architecture that's related to the full span of 2,000 years of history that we have had um, in, the, in the near past. It includes, for example, that the students use techniques uh, for watercolor rendering and hand drafting that has long gone from many universities. These techniques are then also supported by work related to uh, sketching and actual woodwork that they do as a part of the course and training work that they do at the School of Architecture. Along with that, we also have a program in historic preservation. Uh, in historic preservation, we look at documenting historic buildings and at the same time seeing how they can uh, be addressed in relation to preservation of them for the new future. Dharma is part of that understanding of historic preservation from the School of Architecture. We try and work with World Heritage sites that need to uh, be seen as a part of preserving history for posterity and for advancing the knowledge of research that we know about that site. For example, we create uh, tools and methods by which scholars in the field can come together and bring their research on one platform. And I'll talk about that briefly at the end of this presentation. We also use various tools and techniques that enhance this research and particularly help us in bringing the visual dimension of our work in understanding and complementing preservation of the site. We have partnerships across the globe, but one of the key partnerships I will be pointing out today are those with the ministries of culture, both here in Italy and uh, with that in India. We also are working with UNESCO. We have a four year memorandum of understanding with UNESCO for monuments that need to be preserved across the globe. We're working with, uh, as far the science side with team members of NASA where they have been working with heritage as part of their uh, astronomical studies that they do. We have also some internal partnerships that we have created uh, which uh, relate to companies, for example, Leica Geosystems uh, has been sponsoring most of our uh, equipment that we use on site, which has been tremendously useful when we go to different uh, research sites around the globe and are not particularly able to carry all our gear with us. We are working with uh, the Italian National Research uh, Unit, which is the Tianare, and also we are working with other um, departments at the university that are uh, you know, connecting with us either in the form of new research advancement, for example, the Center of Research Computing, uh, Physics Department, or for example, funding some of our work through example of Nanowick Institute. Our work from in Dharma started in 2006. Um, I have had previous background with laser scanning when I was working at Technical University Dresden. But I wanted to bring this to this university with the idea that we can actually find a comprehensive way of digital mapping and beyond that go to how it can help preserve the site without needing a particular technical expertise. Let me explain what I mean. Um, 
We are right now working on multiple projects around the globe. It includes the Taj Mahal, but Taj Mahal is just one part of some of the major projects we are doing. We are also working on the Roman Forum. We're working on fortified churches in Romania. We've worked on monasteries in Nepal. Um, so our, our work is pretty diversified. We, the goal of our work has been particularly related to finding ways in which people can combine one technology with another, but at the same time, find a way to uh, bring a comprehensive sense of it. Um, let me start by showing you something that would be of interest. This is a video we have put together of our work at the Roman Forum. Can, I, can people see this? Yes, yeah, so we're looking at slide 12 right now, Kripali. Okay, hold on just a second. Hmm. Okay, so let me shift the screen share to... Okay, now we're looking at some <laughs> some really interesting 3D renderings in strange colors. Maybe you can explain those for us. <laughs> yes, yeah, so basically this uh, 3D renderings are coming from multiple point clouds. We use the Leica 3D scanner for our work. The scanning uh, allows us an accuracy of up to one millimeter, where you're able to take all details on a monument, even up to surface, pavements, anything and everything that is visible to the eye. The technique used is that of a laser measurement. So basically you're looking at a laser pointer and you take that laser pointer and you multiply it by a million times and you are able to get documentation of a level that is much, much more accurate, precise and three-dimensional than what is available with the two, through 2D measure. Professor, this, would you be able to get that back up on the screen for us so that we can see it while you're talking through it? Okay. Can you see this video? Did you see oh, this? We're video? seeing you guys right now. Oh, okay. we're seeing the video for a couple seconds, and now we're back on you guys. Okay, okay, hold on just a second. Was there a lag for this? Okay. Uh, there was a very little lag. Uh, I didn't notice much lag, but. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, just a second. Can you see it now? No, we're still seeing you guys. Hold okay. On. Yep, we got it. Oh, now we're back on you. Oh, oh okay. Okay, <laughs> better? I think, it, the, uh, okay, so one of our problems, of course, is data sharing because our data is so big. This is a file, for example, that is four gigabytes and it's just being loaded. One of the the research questions we are now trying to formulate is how do you get major scales of data that is extremely difficult to put online to be visible to people? And here you go, we are having. Just a second, I'm sorry about this. So while Professor's working on that, Katie, how did you get involved uh, with the team? What inspired you to pursue a career in architecture and then seek out this research opportunity? Um, I think it was sort of a deliberate decision. Over the summer, I put a lot of thought into what I wanted to do after graduation. And I knew that the typical architecture student career path wasn't really one that I wanted to follow. Um, I'm not sure if I want to practice at a firm or go into scholarship and research and wanted to explore what a career in research might be like. And Dharma was sort of the perfect opportunity for that especially being in Rome the whole year um, and having Professor Cruchet in Rome the whole year, it makes it really convenient to get involved with her office right next to Dora Studio. <laughs> um, and it's been an ext extraordinary opportunity so far. I've learned a ton and have become very tech savvy with architecture research 
equipment, which is super useful for um, someone who wants to go into historic preservation after graduation. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I guess it's kind of a question for both of you. Is, is this amazing technology? You know, what, what was the state of the field like before this technology was introduced? And, and then how does uh, working with Notre Dame open up new doors in terms of bringing some of this amazing research into the field? And what kind of an impact has that had? So first of all, it's not just technology. Let me explain that we have, uh, we combine two mediums, scanning and, uh, and other instruments in the field are something that is available with companies. Anybody can go out there and 3D document a site. It's not just that. We actually take documentation and we put it at a complete different level. We research it to a degree where you understand anything and everything you're seeing to a detail level that is not typically visible or understandable uh, in the field. Um, so when you are, when, for example, we worked at the forum, we work from the Colosseum up to the Tabularium. It's a whole site with maybe around 25 monuments that you're looking at. At the Taj Mahal, we're not just working at the Taj Mahal, but with 46 other monuments that are on the site. Uh, that sheer scale is just very difficult to hand measure. Imagine how many years it would take for sure. anybody to do that. And so that has taken, that was a revolution that happened in the field from a person called Ben Casera, who was the founder of this technology. And he brought this in and then it was taken over by Leica. So we understood this method and we wanted to enhance it further. So what we did was we took the scanning technology and together with the CRC team, we tried to find out how we can use the same methods like the gaming modules that people use to create surface textures that can be making this into a much more like a virtual a spaced feel and where you can actually get an experiential sense of how these monuments work and look, but at the same time, it's as close to real as possible. That's, that's fascinating. And then what, what kind of new insights has this, uh, has this, having this, you know, 360 degree view of things and have it digitally documented, what kind of new insights has this been uh, providing to you? What are some of the big, you know, eureka moments that each of you have had in your research that's uh, thanks to these techniques that you guys are helping to pioneer? So one, one eureka moment, let me say, has been, for example, when we have been able to um, go on uh, the topmost level of the Taj Mahal minaret. Uh, it was a very scary moment. Uh, <laughs> there are bats infested into the minaret Jeez. itself. <laughs> and it's a pretty scary place to go through. Uh, it's very tight and it's very high and there are no safety, safety nets. Uh, for, there are signatures from 1940, 45 that exist there. People weren't, it, it's not accessible to the normal crowd. And as we were going through it, I remember my colleague, uh, Chris Swede, looking at all these pictures and taking pictures and trying to understand what it meant to go through these places which have not been accessed by people for at least the last 60 years. Um, and we, we sat there and we were scanning um, uh, the Taj Mahal and we realized that some of, these, some of this information will never be available to anybody else until somebody like us comes there and makes it public and makes it available to others. Uh, they may not be able to go to those minarets, but I, we are hoping that that experiential feel can come to them in some way or the other. Great. Well, we have our first question in. Again, if you guys have questions and you're watching us from around the world now, please either use them in the Q&A module in your Hangouts window. Send us an email, proud to be Notre Dame at gmail.com. Or you can uh, hit us up on Twitter, hashtag proud to be ND. Amy asks, uh, how does this technology work? Can you explain to us how it works? Is it stuff that was designed for this purpose or has it been retrofitted to do the work that you guys do? Okay, so there is some retrofitting that we are doing. It's not completely just available on the market as it stands. So let me, finally, our, our share thing is working, so we should be able to show you the video we want. Sure, go ahead. Let's try that, and then I'll explain what we are doing further, okay? Mm hmm okay. okay, so here we go. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Great, okay. So this is the Roman Forum. We have started from the Colosseum site, and we are going through the whole uh, Temple of Venus in Rome. And if you can see the pixelated character, yellow sure. and green, that's basically coming from the scanner. When the scanner picks up uh, the surface uh, measure, it's basically just light working. So 
imagine that you have a scanner in place and it, it emits a laser point. That laser point goes to that surface, comes back, and the time that it takes is recorded. That basically gives you a coordinate or a position where this point has been in cloud. And then it creates like a cloud form. Basically what you're looking at is a cloud of dots uh, and surface coordinates that have been created throughout the site. This is not one scan. It is multiple scans that have been put together. So you are, you are having around um, at least 3 million points that have been put together in one scan. And then you have 26 to 8, um, 46 scans that come together to make such a visual image. So just the sheer level of data is immense. Now, that is technology that is available. Okay, now we go beyond this, and I'll explain that in a second, just for Amy's sake. Um, sure. Can you see this? We can see the slideshow again. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, can you, can you, full, uh, can I, can you see it now? We can. Okay, excellent. So what we do is we use five different techniques on site. Before we go on site, we do a lot of historic uh, uh, study. We actually understand the site much better uh, by going through historic resources. What kind of information is available about this site? What are the questions that haven't been answered before? Uh, what is available and what is not available? We do catalog all of that. So we literally go through scholars' data. We go through what the superintendents are, or for example, the archaeological team has for information, and we start cataloging that set of data. We also create field notes, because field notes, as I'll explain in a few seconds, helps us beyond just having a cool 3D scan data, uh, which is basically us going and physically feeling the site, understanding each stone, each fragment that's there. It's basically what um, a lot of people in archaeology and also in, uh, you know, in the field of measure drawing would do. We also use the technique of photogrammetry, which is basically rectifying images and taking uh, elevational information out of it. And then we use a technique called gigapan. Now, gigapan is a technique found by Mellon uh, and worked together for, uh, for example, NASA used it on Mars to be able to take millions of photographs and put them all together and to be able to get a high resolution image out of it. So in this photograph that you see where I've written the pan, I don't know if you can if you can see my pointer. If you try and find where this cross is in relation to the whole image, can you do that? Can any can you guys find it? It becomes really, really difficult mm -hmm. because that cross is right there. Can any can, uh, can, can you see we're, my we're, seeing, we're still seeing slide 12 at the moment. Okay. Oh, okay. We're seeing okay. The now. Okay. It's, it's probably the problem when I do a zoom, zoom in level. Okay. Here oh, you that go. could be. Yes. Yeah, so here you go. Is, is this better? Yep. We're seeing methodologies now. Yes. So those are the five methods I talked about. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you see, uh, for example, the, the fact that Gigapan is one of the methods that we use on site. And this is an image of, made up of around uh, 500 images that have been put together. So you can, what it allows you to do is it allows you to zoom at a much detail level. Each image that we produce is around two gigabytes in size. And basically you get cracks, you get all kinds of detail information out of it. Um, we then take this technique and we combine it to be able to do really cool 3D models. And I'll show those to you in a second. But um, this is uh, explaining where our site is. Um, can you guys see the, the, the map slide number, I think slide number 15 in front of you? It is showing the riverfront as it's uh, seen today at Inagra near the river. And there are around 46 tombs and gardens here, all of them that form the riverfront of Agra. The Taj Mahal is this complex here. And 
if you see this is the tomb itself so now i'll give you a sense of scale that's the tomb and the human right. scale, human scale is this small do you see people on the platform there that's the human scale so the sheer scale of our work is tremendously big and we end up having a lot of data that gets collected with multi with a level of accuracy of from one millimeter to one centimeter for all the monuments that we work on. That's fascinating. You know, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Cindy asks, do you think this technology has application outside of preservation of historical sites? So is it being used in other ways now? Or do you foresee there being potential uses for this kind of 3D mapping technology uh, in, in, in other use cases? Yes, it has been used. Actually, it came from another field. It came from science and, in, and engineering to preservation. Mm -hmm. It's been used in oil industry, uh, where they have been working on oil mines um, and where they want people to do a quick job with uh, and identifying and understanding where the different pipelines are. Like I said, NASA has used this technology. Google uses this technology. For example, in California, the Google cars that you see that are zipping by without a driver, they actually have a scanner in built in them. And that scanner goes at a very high speed and calibrates where the car is in relation to another car. So that's the technique that's used for, for that technology. It's the same right. technique, but having different applications. Fantastic. Mark uh, has chimed in. Thanks, Mark, for your great question. Um, what made you guys start the team? So tell me a little bit about how Dharma got started. Uh, how did you determine the kind of people that you needed to be on the team? Mm -hmm. And how big is it right now? How big is your operation today? So we uh, we have a whole team list at the end of this presentation. Maybe I can, I can go there uh, for a second. <laughs> um, but we have been working since 2006 on this, and our team has grown. Um, let me let me let me first start. I showed you guys our partners list, right? And then we have a, a larger team of just professors and research assistants. Each year, I have or uh, two research assistants that work with me, and these assistants are typically the people who are really the slogging team. So Kirsten here is <laughs> is a slogging team. They work very very hard, and they typically stay at least for three years with me. So. They do projects and they really get engaged and involved. And then we have team of student contributors that uh, over the years have contributed for different projects. So they come in and join the team for specific project work and they will contribute for maybe a year or two and then they go back. But the kind of uh, response I get is tremendous. They, um, the projects uh, are involved at a time at least 12 uh, members. And then beyond that, there will be um, uh, other contributors from other fields that join in at certain times. Uh, the students get a lot of great output out of it. Once they go out, they can use this work to get internships with really cool places. Great. So, um, Kristen, let's let's bring you into the conversation. Being one of these great student contributors. Um, what does this experience offer you as a student? And Brian in particular asks, you know, what are the benefits of doing this research in person in Rome, being able to take the opportunity to see these historical sites in person rather than uh, reading it in a textbook or, or doing it with more traditional methods? A um, lot of questions, so I'll try to tackle <laughs> each at um, <laughs> once. But I think working with Crochet in person is a lot easier than working at a distance. I know that some of the research assistants who um, join their third year in Rome, um, get a lot accomplished, and then it becomes like a struggle to keep up with the work from a distance. Um, so this year is like super pivotal for um, involvement and engagement. And then um, it's sort of up to you, I guess, how much involvement you have after that, how responsible you are keeping up on all your work. Um, as far as experiencing all the sites in person, it's a lot different than what I expected. Um, the Taj Mahal specifically, which um, I visited for the first time relatively recently, just like over a month ago. Um, I've always been super fascinated by Eastern architecture and it's not something that I can get exposure to really anywhere else, even studying abroad in Rome. So that was sort of a dream come true and 
she talked about it a little bit, but just the scale of the Taj Mahal kind of took my breath away the first time I saw it. It's the most ethereal looking building I've ever seen. And it's very um, immediate the first time you see it. Um, the impact that the beauty of Eastern architecture has on the culture because the sites are so sacred to the people and so culturally significant and so well protected and you can tell how proud they are of their sites and that's something that I wasn't really used to in the United States. Um, sort of touring the DC monuments, they're very impactful, but the pride that you experience, um, at least that I experienced visiting the Taj was really a great experience to have. Thanks. So, Professor, tell us about how the conversation gets started. I mean, how do you just walk up to local governments in these countries? Um, how do you even start a conversation like that? Say, so, you know, we really love to get right up close to your monuments and photograph every square into them. Um, mm -hmm. how, do the, how do those conversations even start, and how long does it take from the time that contact is initiated to the point where you actually have, you know, people on the ground uh, doing the research? It's not that easy. First of all, I, you know, we've spent years, years getting to that level where people will believe what we are talking about, and it doesn't sound insanity. The other problem <laughs> is that these monuments are highly protected. Uh, there is an Indian, the Indian army stands outside the Taj Mahal. You can't take anything inside. Forget, forget taking a laser scanner. What is a laser scanner? Why are we here? All kinds of problems start. So it's not that easy. But at the same time, um, you know, once you convince uh, the government bodies and people involved in these projects about the need and why is this crucial, uh, they understand the cause. They understand uh, what, what is necessary. The other thing is we are a research-based university. That helps. We are not a company that is trying to get propaganda out of it or that we are trying to you know, get this and use it to our benefit in any way where we are trying to make little miniature models of Taj Mahal out there or something like that. Mm. So it helps get people um, understanding that this this is a research endeavor. And the other thing is they want to know a lot of things. We also do damage mapping. So while we document, we also understand how seriously damaged a site can be and what kind of efforts need to be taken to preserve it. Because of, because of our holistic nature of our research, uh, it allows them to understand some problems that they may not be observing right away and how to uh, work with them in the sense of preservation. So some of our present projects and also some of our future projects we are planning on are basically doing this, where we are, we are understanding um, potentially what kind of risk uh, by itself the building has and how you would want to protect it. Um, so at the Taj Mahal, this was one of the crucial concerns they had. At the forum, for example, they were looking at basically the sheer scale of information they have. They have been collecting resources and information for years now, and they wanted to understand how they could collectively bring it together. And so that's, a, that's another project that uh, we work with people. We do not try and tell them this is what we do, but we work with them. The management team on site actually works with us as partnerships. Right. And then aside from your writings that obviously are the, the biggest kind of output of your research and that can be shared with the entire world, um, are you, at the end of the day, do you end up sharing any of this raw data back with the governments or protectionist bodies that you're working with on these sites? Um, kind of, I guess the question that we're hearing is what's in it for them essentially outside of just, you know, the, the research about the integrity of the building. Is there information that they're able to take away with that? Yes, absolutely. That's one of our priorities. We make sure that all our research that we do is available to them firsthand. Um, we also give them all our raw data, so they are equal partners in this pro uh, in this project with us. The other thing we do is uh, we make it accessible to them in a manner that they can actually work with it. I'll give you an example. When people work with 3D, 3D scanner, uh, that information comes in this kind of you know quasi file format that nobody else can open. Imagine yourself, right? If you do not know this technology, how are you going to work with it? How are you going to actually use it to your benefit? And that becomes one of the key questions that we face. So when we do the merging of these five different techniques, we actually create a hub of resource 
that is available to the local governments that they can work with this information directly without independent of the software that is needed from individual companies. And then I think as far as helping share what we find in the research with students, um, I know that Dharma is working on developing an app that has a lot of the information um, mm -hmm. found with the 3D scanning, um, all the other methodologies sort of reconciled into a very accessible and interesting um, app. And Professor Crucian will share that with you in a second. So for example, here you go. Um, we have we have a lot of information that comes out of our work. Um, we create, uh, here is what you can see. The first slide show, or the first part of the, uh, the slide shows how the scan data actually reveals sectional information on our site. This is the form again. We actually create pencil drawings out of it. Uh, and then these are watercolor, just like any other drawing would be. Now this, fall, this can be taken up by any scholar in the field and then used to create uh, information directly off. So we produce these and we supply copies of this to the original group. We also do some kind of in, uh, you know, understanding of what previous researchers have actually worked on site. This you can see is the green part of, this, uh, of the information is our scan data and it's actually giving what's happening on site. And then we compare it with other scholars in the field and what kind of information they have collected and we try and create a resource that understands, okay, what, uh, where, which scholar was the most closest to the real information that exists on the site, and how can you make interpretations out of it? This, so this is our student work, uh, for example, showing some of the uh, capitals seen on the Temple of Fos uh, Castor and Pollux in the forum, and you can see how these have been shown in a reconstructed form. Uh, showing the technique which was used by the Bozar Arts students. We also uh, take the scanning and Giapan technology and we combine it into really cool models like what Kirsten was talking about, which becomes 3D uh, uh, information. These are shared in exhibit form. And let me share, show you what that means. Um, These are done uh, by the uh, CRC team, Center of Research Computing. This is Chris Sweet actually designing new software and hardware to be able to get us into this combined state. You can see much of this information on our website, which is dharma3d.org, and you can see some of the data that we are putting in. Let me show you this model. Please tell me if you can see it. So we're seeing just, oh, here we go. Yep, it's loaded now. We're seeing it. It's the Arch of Titus, and you can see the first layer was that of the scan data. Without creating a surface texture to it, uh, we can apply directly uh, gigapan images, and you can see the, the parts of individual images here. So you can also see the kind of quality of resolution. This is extremely high resolution information, yeah. and you're able to apply imagery on top of it such that you can measure off of it. You can see cracks in it, you can also experience it in a 3D modeled form. This then becomes uh, uh, the, the final product that we, it gets applied in our app uh, format. Now you'll say, why is the app not out as yet? The app is not out because the governments are very protective of their data. And we are trying to find a more simplified version that will be available to public now. And uh, because of security reasons, some of this information stays hidden from the public. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, again, thanks to everyone for watching right now. Uh, we are chatting uh, live from Rome with Krupali uh, Krusche and Kristen Gates with the School of Architecture. Uh, if you guys have questions, please continue to send them in using the Q&A module in your Hangouts window by sending us an email, proud to be Notre Dame at gmail.com, or by hitting us up on Twitter with the hashtag proud to be ND. Professor, let's take a step back into kind of your history and how you got involved with this line of work. I um, mean, doing some research, there's, I think there's been some family influence that's had a, a big impact on your desire to get into this field. Uh, tell us kind of your story and how you made it to, to get here to Notre Dame and, and, and over to Rome. 
Well, uh, my dad was a mathematician, uh, a professor uh, in India, and he would take us on uh, trips around India every time. Every few uh, days we would be traveling and we would be looking at heritage around in, in India. We went to, at a very young age, we went to the Taj Mahal, and he would talk about proportions with me, mathematically, of course. Um, but he, he was uh, very much wanting to that I could see how I would want my future to be. He wanted me to grow into medicine just like any other Indian parent would. But then when he understood I wanted to study architecture, he told me, you want to be careful about this. Architects work very hard. They work uh, very much like medicine students do. And I said, I'm prepared for it. So mm -hmm. that's where my whole uh, track in architecture started. And after that, uh, when, you know, I worked with, uh, you know, the people who have built the Frown Kershe and Dresden. it. It's a church that has been completely rebuilt uh, from uh, after war. It was completely destroyed uh, in Germany and it had to be rebuilt from stones like piece by piece. And during this reconstruction, they uh, used the 3D scanning method, but in a very small scale. They hadn't you know, really found the whole understanding of what to do with it. And I was involved in this team at an early stage of my life. And that just triggered off this whole discussion about wanting to uh, take on to, you know, documentation in a degree that would help a reconstruction of monuments in, if we need them. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So, you know, I, I have to ask, uh, the models that you've been showing us during uh, the broadcast today have been just stunning in their detail. The, uh, the utility of these, docu of these documents and of this research, the use from a preservation standpoint, from just a documenting of history standpoint, is undeniable. So I think we're all kind of thinking, you know, has this work been done on the Golden Dome and our, our wonderful uh, buildings on campus? And are there plans to do that in the future? Okay, so in 2006, uh, when we were just, we just got our scanner, uh, we were new and experimental, we started doing this. We just went crazy documenting the <laughs> campus. And we, you know, that's like our, our bed of experimentation. So we would just go out and scan, scan, scan like crazy. We did scan the dome. We did scan Touchdown uh, Jesus, one of the key things everybody wants us to document. <laughs> we went and we... Uh, looked at a couple of other places, but um, we haven't done a comprehensive Notre Dame scan. Uh, we need to. We need to get Father Jenkins to approve it, and then we would love to. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the, the corporations that you guys work with as well. You, you mentioned them on one of the slides, um, in addition to obviously local governments. What's the impact of you know, being able to work with the private sector? Uh, those kind of partnerships between universities and private sectors are so important in the research field right now. They're so important to Notre Dame and Father Jenkins' priorities for the university moving forward. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those uh, operate in regards to your field particularly? Absolutely. The companies involved are actually not just uh, you know you know helping us with um, sponsorship, but they're actually working on research with us. So anytime a new technique comes into play, we work with them to understand and identify how successful it is uh, in the market, and we act like te uh, test case with some of these. Uh, we also work with them to understand how things could be improved. So any of our research, when it comes out, we go and work hand in hand with them to understand how that could influence and improve their company's uh, take on things. So we have been working with Alcom Technologies. We have been working with, uh, we have even uh, spoken to Google about how our technique can work with theirs. Um, we have been, uh, you know, Microsoft, Google, all these places have certain understanding of how they want the future of research to be in relation to the internet. And one of the things, one of the ideas we have been exploring is a visual search. While we have been working on a search based on words, so a typical way you search for something is when you go on Google and you go on a field and you just say, uh, I'm looking for, I don't know, what would you say? I'm looking for 3D scanning. And then a, a couple of examples will come up for you and a couple of companies may come up for you. But that's a, a search based on words. We want to see the transformation of internet with a visual search. What does that mean? Instead of looking for just words, you actually go and you look at a site 
and let's say you're looking at the Taj Mahal and you go in there and you start looking at a piece or part of the Taj Mahal and then you zoom in and it actually fills you with data regarding all the research that has ever been done on that part or that piece of that site. Let's look behind me. There are books here. Imagine that you're going into a virtual library of sorts and you're able to click by visually seeing the names of those books and you're opening up those books and you're able to see what content they have in them. So the change of search from being just written to becoming a visual one because our visual itinerary um, set of information is much, much more than just that of words. Fascinating. So, um, Kristen, uh, tell us a, a little bit about um, the full year program in Rome. It's something that's so unique to Notre Dame. It's something that is the hallmark, obviously, for, for architecture students, the ability to do this work study abroad. Can you tell us about the program generally uh, and then how you managed to kind of link up um, with, uh, with Kripali uh, particularly? Great. Um, so, as you said, the program is very well known for its classical curriculum. Um, it's modeled after the Beaux-Arts method, and a lot of the methodologies that the students learned and practiced then are still used um, today at Notre Dame and very select other schools. Um, in some ways, it makes us very marketable and um, a lot of students who want to go into classicism after graduation are very well prepared for that because of the experience we get um, hand drafting all of our projects, watercolor rendering all of our projects, and just sort of a more comprehensive understanding of architectural history and how traditional and vernacular architecture can be applied to contemporary designs. Um, the third year in Rome is definitely one of the most unique study abroad years I've learned about. Um, it is very intensive academically and as far as Italy is concerned, um, we get to know Italian classicism very well and um, are taught all about local um, architectural traditions within smaller regions of Italy. We have field trips to um, the Veneto, to Tuscany, um, and then next semester to Sicily and Naples and Pompeii. Um, so we get a very comprehensive, um, intense understanding and experience of Italian architecture. And then um, we can use all the knowledge that we gain this year and apply it to the next couple years of practice back at main campus. When we have more specialized studios, um, we have a little bit more freedom to experiment with styles and um, there's different projects that you can um, find which one sort of fits your interests a little bit better. But I think that all the knowledge that we gain here is very applicable to sort of any sort of practice that you can continue after this year. Right. Well, we have just a few minutes left and I have two, two more questions I wanted to get in front of you guys. The first uh, being, how do each of you think that the work you're doing now uh, is helping to further Notre Dame's mission of being a force for good in the world? Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually working right now on an article about religion and architecture, and it is uh, something that tells us um, what Notre Dame is doing and how it will help um, um, things in the future. Um, Notre Dame is very strong about its Catholic mission. At the same time, it is promoting strongly research. Uh, what we try and do is we combine the two here. Um, we look at religions from all over the world that are uh, part of architecture. So uh, we work with various religion, religious bodies. Taj Mahal represents Islamic architecture. Saxon villages talk about 16th century uh, church architecture that exists in Romania. We also have, uh, you know, the forum with the pagan culture and that of the uh, Catholic traditions afterwards. Uh, as we work and we study these, uh, we understand what uh, relationship architecture has for, with religion. Today, as we see some of the incredible uh, fear that's growing around the world regarding the protection of some of these monuments, we strongly feel that we are protecting um, these monuments, their history, their culture through our work, 
and at the same time that of the, un, the thin connection that exists between architecture and religion. I think one of the most important roles it has also is um, its role in helping to digitalize a lot of World Heritage sites that architecture students, um, any students or just the ordinary person can access then. Um, a lot of scholarship is sort of entering into this very digital realm with, you know, more online classes and sort of the slow integration of technology into classes. Um, making all of these very, very culturally significant and historically significant sites accessible to people who normally wouldn't get to experience them um, is very important and very cool. <laughs> sure. So you guys have been to some amazing sites already. You've been able to document some of the world's most treasured landmarks. Um, do each of you have a number one dream site uh, like a number one bucket list site that you'd like to make sure that you're able to get. If you can go anywhere in the world, what would it be? And then what is coming up next uh, for your team? I know that you guys are, are planning to make a big announcement soon about what the next project is going to be. So I think one of my bucket list is already something that we'll announce today. So let me, let me share this uh, quickly with you. Um, our next project is something that we are... Um, we have been keeping under covers because the discussions have been really fresh and we are trying to get them, them, them get them worked out. But, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dharma asks what's next and what would be next is the Vatican. We already are having conversations with the Vatican regarding how we are going to help uh, uh, with some of the work they are doing there. They have incredible resources, but they always would appreciate more help from us, and we are more hap more than happy to help and share. And the project the project will be divided in multiple phases. You can imagine Vatican is a pretty big, complex site. So we have to understand and move forward with multiple phases and how we are going to uh, document this site. And the other thing that we are going to have is what I was talking about before. We are creating a hub on cultural heritage, which basically means it's a one point stop about any and every information you would ever want to have about that particular site. So let's say the Roman Forum. We want to be able to uh, get the, uh, the a kind of a virtual lab that will be able to collect and uh, contain all kinds of information needed to be understood on the Roman Forum to be available to everybody uh, who needs to have that. Those are two fascinating uh, projects, guys. And I know that the whole university community is going to be so excited to see the work that comes out of the Vatican. Kristen, do you have a dream site, perhaps the Sea of Tranquility on the moon or something like that? <laughs> um, being an Eastern architecture nerd, I'd probably have to say, um, Anchor Wat, I think that'd be really cool. <laughs> great, great. Well, again, I think the future is so bright for this program. Um, if you would like to make a contribution, those of you watching us today, to to help the amazing work that's happening here, uh, simply go to donate.nd.edu uh, and indicate that you'd like to help uh, the fight to digitally document historical landmarks. Uh, and, and you can make a difference every single day. And thanks to all of you watching that that do make that difference for Notre Dame each and every year. Um, if you continue to have questions, please, you can keep sending them uh, to our email address and we can get them in front of uh, Dr. Krusha and Kristen uh, in due time. Otherwise, thanks to both of you, Dr. Kapali Krusha uh, and Kristen Gates, live from Rome. Thank you so much for all that you do for Notre Dame and the School of Architecture. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us again today. Thank you again for joining us and we'll look to see you again next season with our What Would You Fight For? Join the Fight broadcast. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.